Welcome to Queen Mary. It's very good to see so many of you here, especially now it's suddenly got so dark in the evenings. Tonight's event is a joint event between the Myland Institute and Queen Mary's Centre for Eurasian, Russian and East European Studies, and we're hoping that that will be a partnership that we can develop over the coming years. As our regular visitors will know, we like a good anniversary at Queen Mary, and today marks exactly 100 years since the general election of 1924. Now, when we think about the great historic elections of the 20th century, we perhaps do not think of 1924 as being one of them. But it is associated with the most sensational, most spectacular electoral scandal of the 20th century, the Zinoviev letter. If you're not quite sure what the Zinoviev letter was, don't worry, we will come to that. Mm -hmm. But it is a story with a number of very contemporary resonances. Mm -hmm. It's a story about fake news, about election interference, about the fear of Russian penetration, and all sorts of lurid conspiracy theories about the role of the intelligence services, the deep state, and the right-wing press. And all of those things remain very present in our politics today. So what we wanted to do was to think this evening about those issues, both in the past and in the present. And we've got three wonderful guests who are going to help us do that. We're going to be hearing first this evening from Jill Bennett. So Jill was the official historian at the Foreign Office. And in the late 1990s, she was asked by the Foreign Secretary, Robin Cook, to launch an inquiry into the Zinoviev letter, which took her to archives not just in Britain, but in the former Soviet Union. And I think it says something about the enduring power of this letter, that 75 years after it was sent, a foreign secretary thought it was important to commission an inquiry into what had happened. There is nobody who knows more about the Zinoviev letter than Jill, so we are very lucky to have her with us this evening. Then we're going to hear from Kieran Martin. Kieran has done all sorts of different things in his career, one of which is establishing the National Cyber Security Centre, of which he served as the first CEO. So Kieran is particularly well placed to help us think about questions of national security, concerns about Russian subversion, and disinformation in the present. And in completing the lineup, we have Jean Seaton. Jean is Professor of Media History at the University of Westminster. And she's also the official historian of the BBC, which has seen a few scandals in its time. She is the chair of the Orwell Foundation and one of the founders of the fact-checking site Full Fact. So again, nobody is better placed to help us think about the role of the media, fake news, and how as a democracy we defend ourselves from misinformation. So can we begin, please, by welcoming our three speakers. Now, before I hand over to Jill, I thought it might be helpful just to give people a quick primer on what the Zinoviev letter is, just in case there's anyone in the room who doesn't have all of the facts at their fingertips. So I'm going to try to do that very quickly and then hand over to the real experts. So the 1924 general election was the first general election in less than two years. And that immediately tells us this is a period of extraordinary volatility. It's a time when both Parliament and the electorate seem to be behaving in unpredictable ways. And there are quite a lot of reasons for that. So it's partly about the legacy of the First World War. The First World War had, of course, ended only six years earlier. So all of the trauma and the dislocation and the devastation of that is still very live. And certainly the effects of that on the economy remain very powerful. It's also about a new electorate. At the end of the war in 1918, five million, five million men and eight million women had gained the right to vote for the first time. So the electorate that's wrestling with these questions is radically new, and no one knows how it's going to behave. It's produced a conservative landslide in 1922. It's produced a hung parliament in 1923 and a Labour government. No one can be sure what it's going to do in 1924. 
So the question of how you shape this electorate, how you get it to do what you want, is very live. It's also only seven years since the Russian Revolution, one of the great seismic events of the 20th century. So it's more recent than something like the Brexit referendum is for us. So one of the great powers of the world, Russia, now has a communist government. And countries across the world are having to work out how they interact with this new force dedicated to spreading communism across the world. At the same time, Britain has its own socialist government for the first time. The first Labour government had taken power at the start of the year. If we look at Conservative Party cartoons, we find a lot of figures like this gentleman on the left here, Labour Ski, and his dog Snatch. So these papers routinely represent the Labour Party as a sort of Russian mini-me, a Soviet agent inside British politics, working to spread the revolution from Russia to Westminster. So we've got all sorts of fears and anxieties bubbling around in British politics. And the question of how do you deal with the Soviet Union, how do you deal with communism, is absolutely central to the experience of that Labour government. So Labour was very keen to get world trade moving again. That was pretty much its central economic policy. So it recognised the Soviet <laughs> Union, it made a trade treaty with the Soviet Union, and it was prepared to guarantee a loan to the USSR, all of which is very unpopular in the Conservative Party and the Tory press. So we've got a government that's dominated by its relationship with the Soviet Union, and it then falls, precipitating the election, on another question of communist subversion, the Campbell case. Mr. Campbell here was the editor of a communist newspaper, The Workers Weekly, and he published an editorial which encouraged troops not to fire on workers, not to obey orders if they were sent into action against strikes, but instead to turn their weapons on your oppressors. And the government first decided to prosecute and then withdrew the prosecution. And that's the issue on which the government falls. So the whole story of the election is about a government that, from a conservative perspective, looks like it's weak on communism. And into that erupts the Zinoviev letter. So on the 25th, four days before the election, this letter breaks in the Daily Mail, not famously a paper very friendly to Labour governments. It is allegedly from Grigory Zinoviev, who is the head of the Communist International, the body whose job it is to spread the revolution across the world. It's addressed to the Communist Party of Great Britain. And it stresses the importance of securing the Anglo-Soviet treaty and the loan. And it argues that doing those things will bring the revolution closer in Britain. So if this letter is genuine, it suggests that the Labour Party are the useful idiots of the Soviet Union, that they are leaving Britain vulnerable to revolution and civil war. And the Mail publishes a lurid editorial, as it so often does, the Socialist Ministry is under the control of the Communist Party. For the sake of the nation, every sane man and woman must vote on Wednesday and vote for a Conservative government which will know how to deal with treason. Now the letter is, in fact, almost certainly a forgery, and well into the 1980s, Labour MPs would call the Daily Mail the Forger's Gazette. But precisely who forged it, why, and how it got into the Daily Mail has always been more mysterious. So there's a historical whodunit here. We'll be hearing from Jill about that. But it's also, as I said before, a very contemporary story. It raises questions about media power, disinformation, foreign subversion, paranoia about foreign subversion, all of which is alarmingly resonant today. So I hope you'll enjoy this discussion this evening. We're looking forward to hearing your thoughts and your questions a little bit later on. And I will now hand over to Jill. So Jill. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for setting the scene in that way. Um, well, today is, if you haven't noticed it, red letter day, literally. 
I keep a Google <coughs> alert on the Zinoviev letter for reasons that I will explain. And um, this morning, it told me that there are references to the letter in the Morning Star, the Guardian, the Belfast Newsletter, and several other newspapers last night. There was a question about the Zinoviev letter in University <coughs> Challenge. And apparently this afternoon, though I missed this, there was a play on Radio 4 about the Zinoviev letter. So if this is not Red Letter Day, I do not know what is. Now, as I wrote in, I've written a book about this, the Zinoviev letter, The Conspiracy That Never Dies. There is not a decade since 1924 when the letter has not been in the news, mentioned in Parliament, or raised in the media. I joined the Foreign Office as a very lowly historical research assistant in 1972, and already the Zinoviev letter was one of the controversies that the historians were dealing with, and it carried on being on my desk until I finally cut the cord with the Foreign Office, which I'm hardly like to say was not until 2023, 51 years after I got there. But I wasn't always working on the Zinoviev letter, but I'm just going to, I mean, Robert said a lot about it. I'm just going to whisk through a bit. And now, if I can find out how we do this. Here we are. Here is Grigory Zinoviev, president of the Comet 10, who almost certainly did not write the letter, <laughs> although it's impossible to prove that. And indeed, once when he was shown the letter, he said, I didn't write it, but if you'd showed it to me, I would have signed it. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the big mysteries about the letter is the fact that there has never been any copy of the original of it found. The only copy that we have is this. I know it's not very clear, but that is uh, part of a telegram sent from the Secret Intelligence Services station in Riga to... SIS headquarters in London uh, with the text containing the text of the letter. And although this is not absolutely categoric, there are good reasons to believe that every text that has been produced anywhere ever since by whichever person is a retranslation of this. And although there's lots of people who've written whole books arguing about the textual question, I think the textual questions are totally irrelevant because it, it was... It was sent in English, which is also notable, but it was retranslated and translated from Russian many times. So that's what it looked like, and that's the only text we know. You've already heard about MacDonald. Here he is, Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary of the first ever Labour government, which had done an astonishing job, in fact, hanging on in there for nine months of 1924, when under sustained attack from the right-wing press and the Conservatives and, of course, being undermined by the Russians because, actually, historically, Russian governments have never liked Labour governments. They've always preferred because they like what they know. And, and absolutely, Stalin was not pleased to see there was a Labour government in 1924. He felt that they were class traitors. But actually, they knew but it was a bit like Stalin in 1945. He didn't want Churchill to lose the election. We can't go into that with my can ask last time. Here's another of these posters, such as you've seen that Russian feeling, vote Labour and bring fresh vigour to British, British industry, but it's a joke. Um, now, the involvement of the intelligence agencies. After the loss of the, 19, uh, the, the election that took place on the 29th of October, now, there are plenty of people, even now in the Labour Party, who will say that the Zinoviev letter lost them election. It didn't. Labour actually polled more votes in that election than it had in the election that put it in power. But the Conservatives, which had been split, had come back together. But they immediately, the Labour Party, they blamed the Conservative Party, they blamed civil service, they blamed what people call the deep state now, they blamed the intelligence agencies, and they accused them of having forged the letter. This is a big question we can talk about later. But the two people who were involved in this, C, the chief of SIS, um, um, Admiral Sir Hugh Sinclair, and Sir Vernon Kell, director general of MI5. Also involved, possibly, uh, Desmond Morton, the man about whom I wrote a biography, uh, who was the person who was actually handling Russian material within SIS, and who conveniently, when interviewed about it, claimed to have forgotten the whole thing. 
And this man, Sir Joseph Ball, originally in MI5, and he then went to run the research department of Conservative Central Office and is a very shady figure indeed. Philby comes into it too. Uh, and the reason for that is because my investigation commissioned by Robin Cook was not the first one, the first cross Whitehall. There had been one done in the late 1960s as a result of Philby's defection. Philby's defection in 1963 really upended British intelligence. There was a, a great worry that there may be other, there may have been other traitors, there may have been other operations that were compromised. And the agency set up a joint committee to revisit all sorts of old operations. And one of them uh, was a lady called Ms. Millicent Baggett, recently retired from MI5, who did a huge investigation into this Noviev letter, on which I have to say I relied heavily when I came to it in the late 90s. Now, Robin Cook, sorry, I've only got a short time, so we, you can ask questions. Robin Cook, how did this come about? Well, it wasn't that Robin Cook thought we must find out about this. In fact, he said it's 75 bloody years ago. <laughs> it, but what happened was that um, Nigel West, a.k.a. Um, the former uh, Conservative MP, Rupert Allison, he wrote a book together with a former KGB colonel uh, <coughs> called Ali Aksadioff, called The Crown Jewels, which purported to publish material that Philby and other traitors had taken to Moscow. This book was published in 1998, and it contained a big chapter on the Zinoviev letter. And there was a real, a lot of questions asked in Parliament on the lines of, why must we read about our history from traitors' material supplied by the Russians? And there was such a feeling about this that Cook, his initial reaction was to say, this is too, too long ago. Everybody can see the material, SIS, no, 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 because... The rule says SIS never ever uh, admits to sources or methods and it does not release its files and they, uh, they arranged for Cook to renew the pledge to that. So I was given special access to all the intelligence agencies' archives in order to research this and so that you could say you'd looked at everything. And as Robert implied, I also went to Moscow and I also went to, this is me, um, Russia allows access to files on letter. Now, this was a brief window in the 90s after the collapse of the Soviet Union, obviously before things really went bad um, in, in Anglo-Russian relations, when actually the Russian government were extremely helpful. They facilitated my visit. Um, they opened the archives. I was very lucky in this, and I got a lot of very useful material from the Russian archives. And this is uh, uh, me just before I was going off there. And I published a report um, in February 1999, which uh, Robert, Robin Cook publicised and wrote an article about and so on, essentially saying, I was pretty sure it was a forgery, but we can't be absolutely sure who forged it. And uh, you can see the result of this. Two, when the, this is the day the report came out. The, the Guardian says, Zinoviev letter was dirty trick by MI6. The Times says... MI6 did not write this novel, <laughs> which gives you a pretty good idea of how divisive this issue is. And I carried on working on it, and things kept coming up, various things came up, and uh, I published a book in 2018, which brings the story, if you like, up to date, although there are people still, I know, publishing books in which they have uh, theories and new, new information about the letter. And while they may... Uh, go a further towards answering some of the questions. I very much doubt that it will lay the conspiracy to rest. It really is the conspiracy that never dies. I would just like to mention one particular extra point which is relevant to what Robert was saying and what Kieran's going to talk about. Now, today when people talk about this information, people often say, well, it, you know, the internet and particularly social media has meant that stories go around the world in split seconds. In 1924, when you've only got sort of fairly early wireless and telegraph, stories still went around the world incredibly quickly. There were organisations producing forgeries to order. As one particular man, Vladimir Orlov, based in Berlin, he was being paid by Red Russian, White Russian, 
German, British, and Polish intelligence all at once, and he sometimes supplied for he supplied forgeries to all that, which is one of the reasons this whole story as a novel is so complex. But he got these documents with this, apparently the speed of light wherever they should go, and so you know although obviously it's not like the internet and it's not like social media, spreading disinformation fast. Russian subversion is nothing new at all. And I would just say the reason I keep a Google alert on the Snoviev letter is because there have been over the years, I might read a story on there that says, the Russians say, foreign office historian Jill Bennett denied, I mean, I've done nothing, it's nothing to do with me at all, but I like to know what's being said about me, <laughs> just in case. I think I'm going to stop there because really it's a huge story and you're very welcome to ask questions later on. Thank you very much. I'm sure there will be lots of questions for Jill, but let's move up to the present now and uh, hand over to Kieran. Um, thank you. Just checking, can people hear? Good, great. Thank you. Um, well, look, this is a daunting uh, task to follow at Jill. Uh, indeed, um, the panel is so distinguished that I, hes I hesitated in accepting Robert's kind invitation. One of the reasons I did was um, I think it's really good to put current speculation and concern about interference, digital interference, hostile foreign interference, whatever you want to uh, call it, into some form of historical perspective. As originally a history graduate, I do see a lot of things that we think of as new, but trying to mess around with democratic processes based on misuse of the latest technology is not new, as we've just expertly held, uh, heard. Uh, even, actually, in terms of uh, current speculation and debate about the role of um, former civil servants in politics, I was delighted to hear of a rather dodgy MI5 uh, figure <laughs> becoming uh, head of Conservative Central Office. That's a, uh, that, 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 that's a new one. So that my, my, uh, or not, as it turns out, but um, my personal history in this, um, I went to work in the deep state at the end of 2013. We weren't talking much about um, uh, election or political um, uh, security at, at that point. But even before the infamous events, which I'll cover in 2016 in the United States, we were getting a little bit concerned by the use of uh, digital interference, cyber attacks, if you will, uh, on things connected to the political process. So in 2015, there was one of the strangest events in sort of cybersecurity history when, although it's never been officially confirmed because the French don't do official confirmations of cyber attacks, um, the French equivalent of BBC World was taken offline. It looked initially by people that claimed to be Islamic State, way beyond the capabilities of a stateless terrorist organization. And it turns out that most informed opinion thought it, this was the Russian state. Why they were doing it, but like there's an obvious letter, nobody quite knows and will ever know. But that led us to think about things like the BBC on election night in, in 2015. So we started to think a little bit about the security of organizations and processes that were central to democratic debate. We kept an eye on the Brexit referendum in 2016, but a hill I will die on, unpopular though it may be, uh, to say so as a someone in office at the time, and I'll choose my words carefully, I saw absolutely no evidence of successful digital interference with the Brexit uh, referendum, and I'm happy to defend that under uh, questioning. Then the world changes in 2016, uh, this part of the world, with the Russian state's leaking of Hillary Clinton's campaign information. This triggers widespread concern in Western democracies, and Theresa May, Prime Minister by then, is no exception, and asks the National Cybersecurity Centre and others to stand up a capability on protecting elections and the wider democratic process. Then the politics of the remainder of that decade were rather similar to what you said, Robert, about the um, about almost exactly 100 years earlier, constant elections and um, uh, um, yielding unpredictable results and outcomes. But we have to protect rather more elections than we initially thought we might have to do in 2017, the Europeans unexpectedly in 2019, the 2019 uh, general um, uh, election. What did I learn from that period and since? Um, well. A few things. Firstly, people do talk, and we're seeing that right now across the Atlantic, uh, people, I think, wrongly obsess about elections. This isn't about election interference, it's about political interference. Um, there haven't been that many, I'll come to this, there haven't been that many impactful events in UK politics that you can directly attribute to foreign interference. 
But one of them was, you may recall in the December 2019 election campaign, Mr Corbyn reading out a letter, waving it around in a press conference, saying that there was essentially a secret plan to sell off large parts of NHS capability to uh, American uh, healthcare companies. And it is now the official um, position of the previous uh, government, but backed by um, proper security assessment that this was a Russian hack of um, uh, a senior Conservative cabinet minister's um, private uh, email. But it was done um, probably in January of 2019. And if, if you re recall the dreadful politics of that year, there was no plan for an election that year. Theresa May was still in power at the start of the year. It was slowly amplified and it surfaced during the election campaign. But this was something around destabilising politics. So this is a constant rather than something that's just around elections. The second thing that I learned, and forgive me for being a little bit technocratic in this, but it's, it's sort of how do you do this? You know, if, you're, if your mission in Moscow or wherever is destabilise British or American politics, you know, what, what do you actually do? And there are probably three ways you can do it. So number one is what we now call fake news. That could be amplifying social media posts, or these days it could be creating elaborate fakes using the latest technology. That's one way. A second way is stealing some information via traditional spying, albeit with computers, but instead of using it, which is what spying is traditionally for, I would like to know what the next British Prime Minister is thinking. Who are they going to appoint? What's their policy going to be towards my country, towards trade? I'm going to keep this secret so I've got strategic advantage. That's historic spying, and everybody's been doing it with whatever technology for as long as any of us can remember. Um, uh, but this is different. You leak it to destabilise the politics. It's that, that is what the Russians did. Th that the Russians were spying on Hillary Clinton in 2016 was completely unremarkable. They sh you know, we, we can expect um, uh, Russia, China, whoever, to be spying on all uh, candidates in major elections in the democratic world. What was unusual was they leaked it in a way designed to destabilise American politics. So that's the second way you can do it. And the third way you can do it is attack political infrastructure or electoral infrastructure. So that's the sort of media thing that um, the Russians did on France. But also it's things like the printing of ballot papers, the registering to vote uh, systems, the counting of votes. Look at the news coming out of the US today about apparently some ballots being set on fire, either accidentally or deliberately in Washington State and Oregon. So you know the actual logistics of an election uh, campaign. So those are the three ways you can do it. Um, but to come to the sort of my assessment of where this is, I'll make two statements, one of which you'll expect, <coughs> one of which you mightn't. Um, the one you'll expect is that attempted hostile state interference, particularly but not exclusively from Russia, you'd see it from China and Iran and a handful of others potentially as well, um, is a constant and large-scale activity. And it affects most, if not all, Western democracies. Um, so that's what you expect me to say. What you might not expect me to say is that most of it is strikingly ineffective. Strikingly ineffective. I can think of two electoral processes, uh, two electoral events, only two, in the last 10 years in the West that have been impacted in a way that their perpetrators would have regarded as a success. Number one is Trump-Clinton 2016. Why did it trip tip the election for Trump? I don't know, and nor does anybody, because you cannot get into the minds of millions of Americans in key states as to precisely why they cast the vote that they did. What you can say is the fact that Americans are still arguing about it two electoral cycles later is a win because it helps destabilize um, American politics. The other, I think we can make a case where it actually moved the dial because there is a sort of control factor, is Slovakia last year, where there's a very tightly contested election. There is a deep fake of the moderate centrist candidate, which goes viral for a bunch of reasons that I could go into in, under questioning. Um, it doesn't uh, get taken down in time. There's a media blackout. So traditional ways of saying this is fake are not open because there's one of those pre-election laws that say you can't cover it. And the polls are out by four crucial points. And the polls, you know, the, the post-electoral uh, research in Slovakia suggests this might have done something uh, to it. I really don't think you can make a case. I mean, the Liam Fox um, uh, thing about the health service clearly didn't make an impact in the 2019 election in any meaningful uh, uh, way, um, given the result. I think a lot of it is strikingly unsuccessful. And let's look at why. You know, you look at events of, in the 2020s. So there's a massive information war going on as part of the hot war in Russia-Ukraine. 
And the Russians earlier this year put an awful lot of effort into a technically superb deep fake of Ukrainian TV. They had the Ukrainian Deputy National Security Advisor on saying, in effect, that we, were we the Ukrainians, were responsible for the Moscow terrorist outrage. Technically a superb, I mean, it's pretty gruesome to watch, but technically superbly done, convinced nobody. Why? First of all, it was completely implausible. Secondly, lots of people had watched it live and said, well, this isn't what happened. And thirdly, the Ukrainian TV station released the original and said, this is what happened. So it didn't convince anybody, however good it was. Um, you look at the UK election, I think it's now safe to say that there was no whatever concerns there were, there were no substantive interference. But let's look at what's going on in the US at the moment. Russia are constantly trying uh, various things. Mm -hmm. It is now the official view of the US government that Iran has successfully hacked the Trump campaign, but I'll come back to that in, in a moment in terms of impact. And China has done all sorts of social media types of interference campaigns. And you know what? They might get better, but right now they are absolutely <coughs> hopeless. There's a great study by an Australian cybersecurity company that looks at this, and it looks at the content. And it's pretty unconvincing in English <coughs> in the first instance. If you reply, it either says, as an AI-generated bot, I can take no further part in this discussion, <laughs> or it replies in, in, the Chi in Chinese script. And you're like, okay, so you know, that's not going to have to do anything. Now, I want to come back to this Iran hacking the Trump campaign, because what's in that dossier? I don't know, and nor does the American public. Why? Because this time, the mainstream media, who are still quite important, all the major websites have said, unlike in 2016, we're not going to touch this. This is very clearly the hostile intent of a foreign state, and we are not going to be their witting agents. We, do, we don't know where this is coming from, so we're not going to touch it. And this brings me to the, my final point, which is essentially the underlying missing part of this debate is, is that it's about, it's, it's about us. Yeah. Right, in 2016, what did the Trump campaign and Trump personally do with the Clinton stash of emails? He went, Release it all, brilliant, let's make hay with this. Let's further. So they, they willing and willingly and wittingly aided the Russian uh, operation. Uh, the US media this time has said, um, you know, uh, even though Trump is the, uh, the supposed victim of this attack, we're not, we're not gonna touch it. We forget our own agency um, uh, here. And I think, you know, you look at three groups of, of actors in the, peer, in, in the issue of information, stability and security in democratic processes. You look at big bad foreigners, yes they try, but most of the time they're not that good, right? So, but they're very easy to blame. Who else is easy to blame? Big tech. Oh, they're not doing enough. There's some truth to that. Musk's X is particularly um, suspicious um, uh, at the moment. But look, in this day and age, if people are doing disinformation and so forth, and they, uh, you control or regulate one platform, another way will pop up uh, somewhere. I think you know, we really need to think about this is, uh, this is about us. And you think about, for example, and um, you know, Jill may come back to this um, in, in, in questions, whether um, you know, MI6 did or didn't with that wonderful ambiguity that led to those two different uh, newspaper headlines. Um, one cannot take from, from what you were saying about Zinoviev, you can't take the British domestic atmosphere out of that story. You, you just, you know, and clearly there were some people in the UK who were in some way active in fostering and engineering and landing this conspiracy. We, we neglect the domestic at our peril. I think if you look at the Southport, the horrors of the Southport related riots, again, we talk, oh, it's so easy to blame big tech. What about the British people who were knowingly spreading false information about the, the, pos the identity of the, of, 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 of the suspect? But to finish on an optimistic note, I think there are ways that we can uh, do this. And think back to uh, not 100 years ago, but this, more or less this time last year, the run-up to remembrance. And you may remember the tensions in this city about the Saturday pro-Palestinian march on the same day as, as remembrance. And there was a very technically good deep fake of the mayor. And what was the mayor? The Labour Muslim mayor of London was supposed to be saying, who cares about the Remembrance Day commemorations as long as the pro-Gaza march can go ahead? He said nothing of the sort. What did the Conservative government do? They went on every social media outlet and every media outlet available and they said this is absolute garbage, it's nonsense, don't pay any attention to it and treat it as an attack on our democracy rather than as something to be made advantage of. Don't forget our agency. So um, I'll finish with a, note, a quote from um, a more recent chief of uh, SIS, Alex Younger. He gave a fantastic valedictory interview in 2020 
uh, to the Financial Times, and he said all this stuff around disinformation about interference, almost all of it in the UK in his six years in office, he said, had little if any observable impact at all. And he said societies can choose whether or not they are willing to let others divide them. I think that's worth reflecting on. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kieran, for giving us a, a note of optimism. And your, your point about the role of the press in relation to the Iran dossier brings us very nicely to Jean. So, yes. to you, Jean. Um, so I feel very humble in this situation, and I'm going to be rather, I'm going to sort of fight back at some of the things just because you've, laid, you've made such a strong case. I'm going to start with um, a 2023 uh, quote from the Daily Mail online, one of the largest in the world online situation of things, which says, and there's no, there's no prompt for it, it's just there. That's what's quite interesting. It says 2023, 2019 might have been different. Um, there's an obvious letter that was clearly a blueprint for a British Soviet revolution. And in the election, voters did indeed properly abandon the Labour Party. The Conservatives were swept into power with a massive majority of more than 200 seats. Many historians believe a Tory victory was assured before the letter's publication. So it's, it's a really interesting piece, this. But there can be no doubt that the male's massive scoop <laughs> not only had an effect on the election, but more crucially still, it was to have a long-lasting influence on the public perceptions of the Labour Party, with many believing, even today, that it is little more than a front for communism. <laughs> uh, um, now, I, I mean, I, what I can't do is, is it, so what's interesting about that is that um, in a way, Kieran has just said what all media scholars, I'm afraid, boringly have said, which is that what matters around, this, I didn't mean to say this, but you've prompted me, what matters around, let's call them media messages, is not the hit of you getting one, I mean, if I read that out to you, you don't immediately turn into a sort of Daily Mail, Labour Party's communism. It's, um, it, it doesn't work. It's not like a bullet. It's the drip, drip, drip. And the, uh, uh, the evolution of very effective stories that may or may not be deliberate over time that are com continually repeated that lead us to understand that something called the media used to be newspapers and television, but I think you know, perhaps look at the internet, has an impact on how people see things. And <coughs> historically, um, the standard American <coughs> sociological research, lots of people measuring things till they were blue in the face measuring, and that always measure something if you're an American social scientist, <laughs> even if it's unmeasurable, try and measure it, um, would be to say that actually it, it all didn't matter because the, how you received a message and how I received a message and how you received a message and how Jill received a message was all completely different. So what really mattered, and this, this research actually was very confirming of American democracy in the 40s and 50s and 60s, what mattered was where you worked, where you lived, what your family was like, uh, which, which region you lived in, what kind of work organisation you were in. So it, the research showed, just as Kieran in a way has said, and it's obviously in part true, that um, any of these, none of these messages really worked because what really determined what you thought about things was your substantive real relationship to the world. And there was a lot of research that showed that. Um, one of the problems, the, so the, my first problem, is that a lot of how young people live, live their substantive relationship to the world, the communities they live within, and the relationships they have, and you can see that, I wrote a long time ago, about anorexia, because it was easier to write about than politics in a funny kind of way, <coughs> that they live within communities that actually happen online, that are sort of virtual. So that old story, you'll be protected by your community, leaving aside all sorts of other things that have happened to communities. 
uh, has a nuance in it, which is that people now live in, as it were, media communities. So that's my first problem. The second, more optimistic thing, which is what I was going to say anyway, so, it, uh, uh, but that, that story also requires mediation, horrible word, but transmitting through other institutions. So the Daily Mail, um, still gloating about a scoop, as it were, um, it, I mean, how many people of the, reading the Daily Mail online know about this novel of letter, but they do come away with this wonderful sense that the Daily Mail you know, has this thing called a scoop. Um, th there are other media around in other institutions with other kinds of governments that are around, which then gets me to the BBC. So the BBC itself was the product of this particular period of disturbance and insecurity. It was both a technological invention, you could broadcast, which people had spent the first 20 years of, of the actual technology thinking it was jolly irritating, lots of people could hear, if only you could just narrow it down, or only a few people could hear, it would be so much more effective on battlefields. But it was, so it was technological. But it was also, again, a product, actually, of the First World War and this period. And the BBC, which nobody knew was going to be big, and the Daily Mail, as Asa Briggs said, would clearly have strangled it at birth if they'd have understood that the BBC was going to matter. So that's also worth thinking about. Um, the BBC was also set up, as it were, and the, the, at the core of it is the belief that uh, people should make up their minds in the long term about voting according to their real interests and in an informed way, not have their views bought by big business, not have their views uh, distorted or bought by ideology. Uh, and if you, uh, and that, that, in a way, it's as simple as that. Let, let, let's give people quality <coughs> public service information. And it came out of this very unstable period, actually, um, of, of how people got information. And it, it wasn't perfect. It became, you know, you can go on arguing about how it behaved in 26 and 24. But nevertheless, it, it was driven by those those avoiding letting people be bought by politics or business. So, uh, and that, that gets me to the third sort of pushback, which is that the, this is in a way boring, but the algorithms by which we all buy everything are indeed bought. Your data is indeed just sold to anybody for any reason. And we know very reliably from a whole series of books and disclosures on many of the big tech companies that they, they well, understandably, they wish to make profits. And we do not have the institutional capacity to turn those, those decisions they're making around the information people get in their communities um, into ones that serve publics. So my final sort of point is that but this is all not lost, but we are a long way from some good, sensible solutions. So you can't just produce content anymore that people are interested in, though you do need to do that. And you do need both the software and particularly the wiring that would allow your, your public service interest material to reach people. And there's a real opportunity, and it's a market opportunity. Had, in 2003, the BBC been allowed to launch a public service search engine, would, would we be in a different place? Possibly, one that was powered by public service values. Um, there is now a huge gaping market gap all over the, all over the Western world, really, for um, powerful institutions with proper governance and proper scrutiny and proper, proper, proper way. They'll get things wrong. That's the trouble. You can be proper, but you get stuff wrong the whole time um, to produce information that is, is, is in the public's interest. And my, my final last thing, I think the only way you do that at the moment, because news has become so politicized, news, 
like everything else has been weaponized. So what do you have to do? You have to report. I think that's what you have to go back to the very basics of news and cultural imagination and based on reports. So I'm, I'm optimistic that if people were prepared to take this seriously, there are institutions that we have available that if they were told to adventure and have a go at battling some of this stuff, it might work, might not work, but it might work. But at the moment, we don't seem to be prepared to back those institutions. Great, thank you very much. Right, I'm very keen to get the thoughts and questions of people in the audience, but first, if you'll allow me, I'd just like to put one question to all of the panel, which I think came out of the different things that you were saying. I think one of the problems with the Znoviev incidents is that there is a genuine threat here. Russian subversion was real. The Communist International was trying to express the revolution across the world. It was trying to subvert the British government. And as you say, Zinoviev said you know, he might well have signed this letter had it been sent to him. We know he did send similar letters to other, <coughs> to other countries at the time. And yet, I think you can make quite a good case that the fear of the Soviet Union does more harm in Britain between the wars than the Soviet Union actually does. Because it drives people mad, it sets people against each other, it opens up this sort of tide of conspiratorialism gushing through British politics. So that's one problem. An associated problem is that Labour's attempts to refute the letter <laughs> actually keep the story alive and keep the momentum going and to some extent stop Labour from asking more important questions about why it had lost and what it itself had done wrong. And I think we can see some analogies in the present as well. Russian subversion today is real. It was willing to use a chemical weapon on British soil in Salisbury. And yet the tendency to attribute everything bad to Russia, whether it's Brexit or Trump or anything else, probably stops us thinking more clearly about our own politics. And it again becomes a kind of vector of misinformation. And we also know that the attempt to rebut fake news stories often simply serves to circulate them to ever wider audiences. So I wanted to ask all three of you, how do we walk the line between complacency and hysteria? Whether that's in relation to fake news and social media, whether it's in relation to <laughs> cyber hacking and the sorts of you know, lurid stories we get from the BBC about night sleeper and, and dramas of that kind, or whether it's about our diplomatic relationship with countries like China or Russia today. So Jill, can I perhaps ask you to kick off? Well, I agree with the first part of what you said, mm -hmm. because I've always said that the, it wasn't the letter itself that did the damage mm. and caused the trouble. It was what was done with it. It was the way it was leaked. It was the way it was manipulated by the Tory press. Mm. I don't agree with you that fear of Russia was, uh, was worse than what mm. Russia was doing because there's ample evidence of really serious Russian espionage subversion mm. in the 1920s. That's what, that, you know, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't a red under the bed scare. It was real. Uh, and, of course, that is what confuses this Novia story, because it might well have been, uh, uh, it, you know, it, right from the beginning, that it, it might well have been genuine. And, but I think, I think the diff it, it's always a difficulty, and I think everything that, it, that, that you know, both Jean and Kieran have said, it, it, we, in the end, we are the people who read the stories and talk about them and so on. Now... They can be manipulated, and that's always going to be true, however high-minded your, your institutions might be. But, but what you need is, is, is more of a balance, and you, and you need more, a better education as to how you look at things. I know this is a big ask, but it was certainly, you know, I mean, over the years, yes, there were lots of Labour Party, um, it, it came up again. Because it was a kind, it, it instituted a kind of paranoia. But equally, there were people like Clement Attlee, for example, who, when it was used, it was just such a load of rubbish. You know, just, just, just dismiss it. So, Zinoviev, the Zinoviev letter is, is a good example of how you can't take the politics out of any of these kind of things, hmm. but you have to try and have 
uh, <laughs> balances on each side. And you have to try and have somebody explain to people exactly what the truth is. And, you know, I think what Kieran talked about was very illuminating because in the end, people are, on the whole, sensible. People are perfectly capable of actually detecting, um, you know, things that are totally ludicrous, so to speak. Um, but it is anything like that, um, and particularly in rather febrile political times, which we're all living in, um, West and East, actually, um, I mean, this is, there are big problems, after all, in the Russian media, too. Um, it, it, it's just a good example of what can happen and, and how we all ought to guard against it. Okay. Karen? Um, two quick points, because I spoke for too long, so sorry. Um, <coughs> one, you raised a very important point about Night Sleeper, which, for those who don't know, is a <laughs> I like drama. Night Sleeper. <laughs> I, I, I like it, too. So a message on Night Sleeper is, Night Sleeper is to the National Cyber Security Centre's work as spooks is to yeah, LI5's yeah. work. <laughs> <laughs> the same degree. Absolutely. So having cleared that up, um, I think it is a genuinely difficult point. Russian subversion attempts in the physical and digital world are very real. And so you know, my... Uh, successors uh, in government are issuing all sorts of guidance to energy companies and hospitals and mm. that's all mm. absolutely right. You can see the clear evidence of threats and, 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 and real events. So is the government right? Um, I, think, I think it's still going, but certainly the previous government set up something called a Defending Democracy Task Force. Was that the right thing? Absolutely. Did it do good work? Yes. But I think there's a little bit of a premium on, um, and you know, there's no right answer. It's trying to find the best possible place on a spectrum about how you talk about it. Yeah. And where you go too far is you say, you talk so loudly so often and overhype minor incidents where you know, it's not a neutral act. If enough people in authority tell you know, the British public, we think there's a really serious problem with election integrity, then sooner or later, quite a lot of people are going to start believing you. Mm. And so I think you establish, uh, I think you put a very high premium on, cause, on, on causing alarm as distinct from awareness. And actually, you know, something I'd like to see a little bit more of, I mean, I would say this because it was kind of my own pitch, sometimes say some of this stuff's rubbish. Mm -hmm. It really is. I and mean, China is a great example of this. It might get better, but at the moment, Chinese disinformation operations, some of them, a handful of them can be quite skillful, but most of them just smack of somebody's working to an output target and some large bureaucracy and just have to create loads of this guff and they go home at the end of the day and then they come back in and do it tomorrow and it doesn't really have any impact. We should actually be a bit more transparent about some of that stuff. Um, I, I mean, you're all much more... My sense... So well, I was going to raise what happened just after the Ukrainian... the Russian invasion of Ukraine and I happened to be... Um, I have a foreign office project which brings together Indians, Pakistanis who can't otherwise meet and Sri Lankans and Bangladeshis in Britain and it happened just just that they arrived and I walked into a room and I was rather, I mean I completely understand India's long term relationship to Russia you know, that, that, and it, you know I, I've been doing it for long enough, I know all of that but the entire room was entirely in favour of, um, and these were journalists, in, in favour of Russia, absolutely without exception. So I got Carl Miller in from King's, who was just doing a bit of research on Twitter then, and he sat down with some of the Indians and Pakistani journalists, and he went, and these are journalists, and he, he, his, his research showed, there's a very good Twitter thread, showed the huge, in, enormous springing into action all over South Asia, all over Asia, really, but over South, Southeast Asia, of large numbers of bots who were producing pro-Russian information. And w we sat down, this was very new to me, with people's WhatsApp groups and their Twitter feeds, and they were saturated with pro-Russian stuff. And the most, and the journalists didn't really notice it. And quite a lot of it, had, they just picked it up because they were following groups and becoming. The most lethal was on their WhatsApp groups because those were people that they were, they were families and friends. So, I, just, I mean, I've, if you ask me, 
I would say we haven't been quite alarmed enough or, or sensible enough about this. And the, third, the other thing I would say, I think this has been so disconnected from you know, the ways in which, the terrible ways in which things like Ofcom have been given very big responsibilities and have not even obeyed their statutory duty you know, when they've been given it. So where do you, where do you look, um, if you're a member of the public, for where there is a sort of regulation going on? And I think, I think we've, we're very, we've been very slow. You can't see the architecture which is there to protect us. We don't know where it is quite. Um, even during the Second World War, you knew where the you knew that the Ministry of Information, which absolutely everybody hated, but in fact did a not bad deal, to tell you the truth. The Ministry of Information did quite a good deal between what information the British public could have and what was secret, but at least you knew it was there. So I think we have failed to describe to the public in ways that are secure, are convincing, where safety is held. And I think we've actually let let some of our institutions let stuff through. And I, I still don't, and I, that seems to me a problem, actually. I want to thank you all for coming this evening and for your questions. <laughs> but I particularly want to thank our three panellists for really stimulating and thought-provoking reflections inspired by, but not limited to, the Zlovia letter. <laughs> so thank you to Jill Bennett, Kieran Martin, and Dean Seaton. <laughs>